This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin has sent troops into two separatist regions in eastern Ukraine shortly after recognizing them as independent states. Putin made the announcement Monday during a speech where he questioned the legitimacy of Ukraine as a state. I consider it necessary to make a long overdue decision to immediately recognize the independence and sovereignty of the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic. The two Russian-backed regions had broken away from Ukraine in 2014, leading to a conflict that has left 14,000 people dead. While Russia supported the separatists eight years ago, Moscow did not recognize the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic as independent states until Monday. In recent days, the Ukrainian government and Russian-backed separatists in the region have accused each other of violating a ceasefire agreement. On Monday, a spokesperson for the United Nations Secretary Secretary General condemned Putin's decision. The Secretary General considers the decision of the Russian Federation to be a violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and inconsistent with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. During an emergency meeting of the U.N. Security Council last night, U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield also criticized Putin's move. Russia's clear attack on Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity is unprovoked. It is an attack on Ukraine's status as a U.N. member state. It violates a basic principle of international law, and it defies our charter. What is more, this move by President Putin is clearly the basis for Russia's attempt to create a pretext for a further invasion of Ukraine. The consequences of this action will be felt far beyond Ukraine's borders. Russia's U.N. ambassador claimed Russia was forced to take action in the Donbass region. We remain open to diplomacy for a diplomatic solution. However, allowing a new bloodbath in Donbass is something we do not intend to do. Unfortunately, we are forced to note the extremely negative role played in all of this by our Western colleagues led by the United States. Instead of forcing Kiev to implement its obligations, they have merely been openly egging Ukraine on, repeating the meaningless mantra that the obligations under the Minsk agreement are not being implemented by Russia, which, as we've repeatedly underscored, is not even a party to the Minsk agreements. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky accused Russia of violating the Minsk agreement and undermining diplomatic efforts to resolve the conflict in eastern Ukraine. On Monday, the Biden administration issued limited new sanctions targeting investors in the Russian-backed separatist regions. More sanctions are expected to be announced today. Meanwhile, Germany's announced it's halting the permitting process of Russia's massive Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. The big question now, what will Putin do next? Russia Russia has as many as 190,000 troops near the Ukrainian border. Meanwhile, the United States has sent troops to Eastern Europe, while the U.S. and other NATO allies have increased arms shipments to Ukraine in recent weeks. We're joined now by Nina Khrushcheva, professor of international affairs at the New School, co-author of In Putin's Footsteps, Searching for the Soul of an Empire Across Russia's 11 Time Zones. Also the book, The Lost Khrushchev, Journey into the Gulag of the Russian Mind. She's the great-granddaughter of the former Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev. Her latest piece for Project Syndicate is headlined, Putin is no Nixon. Professor Khrushcheva, welcome back to Democracy Now! We spoke to you, oh, just over a month ago. You were in Moscow at the time. Can you first just respond to the latest developments, the significance of Putin's hour-long address yesterday and declaring the separatist um, areas of Ukraine independent states? Uh, thank you, Emmy. Um, a lot has changed in a month. 
uh, or not much has changed um, in some way because we're still waiting for the big invasion. Uh, I want to correct, not even correct, but sort of amend a little bit the statements about the Russian troops uh, going into, uh, or peacekeepers going into Donbass and Luhansk. It actually hasn't happened yet. And in fact, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, said very uh, prominently that uh, they are holding on on this decision. And the separatist leaders uh, said that it's their decision when they're going to ask for peacekeeping. So in some ways, it does look today that uh, uh, the decision was made to recognize the republics uh, as independent states. But Putin at this point stops here and uh, could be a sign of uh, he is slightly blinking and waiting for the further developments on the Ukrainian side, on the uh, on the Russian side, to uh, to move forward. So this is something that I find, uh, especially in studying criminology, is very important. These little words and steps that are being uh, made and said. Yesterday's speech was remarkable. Uh, in many um, kind of revisionist versions of history, and uh, uh, what was clear in the speech. Uh, in all the rhetoric that was being put forward, is that uh, the address as received this speech were not Ukrainians, were not even Russians. Uh, it was the United States. Is that uh, that's how we see our situation, and we are uh, looking at Ukraine as your, as he said, your uh, client state, and uh, you deal with your client state so it wouldn't be riling the Russian bear. He didn't, of course, say these words, but basically it was all about do not throw the rile the Russian bear, because if we recognize, I mean, we have recognized, and it seems to me that that's where we're willing to stop for now, but it does depend on uh, your kind of diplomacy, your kind of political decisions, and so on and so forth. The rhetoric was tremendous. It was the knife at the Russian throat that uh, Russia was a victim of uh, giant Russia, 11 time zones that you mentioned in, in my book. Uh, the giant Russia was a victim of uh, uh, Ukraine manipulation. Ukraine didn't exist, uh, only exists only because uh, uh, Vladimir Lenin made it so, because otherwise it would have been much smaller, because it was much smaller, uh, supposedly, in the times of the Russian Empire. So if you want to decommunize Ukrainians, we can show you how to you do it. So they were all these threats that can be metaphorical, but also can turn into something much more than than metaphorical and become and become military. So um, what I know from Moscow and friends in Kiev, I mean everybody is on, uh, and in Europe everybody is on on edge and do look for further statements uh, or further actions of Putin. But once again, as we uh, uh, when we spoke a month ago, I still don't see the big invasion. I can be completely wrong. I will be washing my mouth with soap tomorrow. But so far, I think that that's what uh, Putin's message to the West is, is that I made my point to all this giant rhetoric that I'm going to go to Kiev. I have to be, uh, um, I have to sort of show my military or my, uh, my firm prowess, but uh, at this point, we're still not uh, where uh, the Joe Biden says we are. That is, in the in the next few days or next even next few weeks, Putin is ready to go to Kiev. Uh, Professor, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I, I listened to uh, uh, to Putin's speech, at least the translation on C-SPAN, and it. it, it it seemed to me that uh, he was attempting, as you say, a revisionist history, but he was also raising significant criticisms. Uh, uh, he basically blamed uh, Lenin for creating uh, this idea that uh, republics of the uh, uh, the Soviet Union had the right of self-determination to secede, uh, and that uh, somehow that Stalin had a much more uh, uh, control orientation toward the creation of the Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering, in terms of the, um, uh, your uh, great-grandfather, uh, for decades, was the leader of the Communist Party in Ukraine. And in fact, under, uh, uh, it was under Khrushchev that uh, the Soviet Union turned over Crimea 
to Ukraine, uh, to Ukraine. Isn't there some truth to the fact that on, during the Soviet period, more territory was added to what is currently the state of Ukraine? Clearly, the Ukrainian people have always existed. But there was a period where Ukraine grew as a result of political decisions made after World War II and by the Soviet government to increase its size. Uh, and um, uh, I'm wondering your thoughts on that. Uh, well, thank you. Um, yes, it was. I mean, and, and Putin is not a fan of Lenin. We know that he doesn't like revolution, so he doesn't like the revolution of 1917. He always thinks that Russia under the Tsar is what's much grander and, you know, had more gold and more palaces. And we know he loves palaces um, under the Tsar. So that's that's a given. So it's always sort of this nasty comments towards Lenin as well. It's you, Ukrainians who don't like Lenin, but he's the one who gave you all of it. As far as Khrushchev, yes, Khrushchev, and Khrushchev was in love with Ukraine. I mean, he was a Russian, uh, Russian born, but he spent a lot of years in Donbass. In fact, that now that uh, that self-proclaimed republic uh, loved Ukraine. Uh, you had this wonderful song, Ukrainian song at the beginning of the program, and he would have cried because he, in the evening he would always like to listen to Ukrainian songs and actually sing them. So he was a great, great fan. It's a little bit of mythology that it is under him uh, Crimea became uh, became Ukrainian and was transferred from Russia to Ukraine. It was 1954. He was the head of the Communist Party, but he was not the head of the state. He was not the head of the government. So there's no signature under any of this documents that transferred uh, Crimea to the Russian Federation. He was, uh, it was a collective leadership at the time it was called. So it was a mutual decision. Of course, with his recommendation, he thought it was, it would be proper for managerial purposes. But really, it's much more, I mean, he is, since he's a Putin villain, in a sense, since he didn't, Khrushchev denounced Stalin, uh, as, uh, um, as it is well known at the 20s Party Congress, uh, in a secret speech in 1956, and therefore he sort of made uh, as a villain for um, kind of one of those, uh, along with Mikhail Gorbachev during Perestroika, is one of those reformist leaders who uh, uh, shed the Russian lands while people like Stalin and now like Putin, uh, they are putting them together. So I think that is uh, something important to, uh, to clarify. But regardless of how Russians feel about Crimea, for example, legally it is not, uh, it was, uh, Ukraine was an independent state, became an independent state in 91. And so in international law, uh, the Crimea obviously is Ukrainian territory and so is Donetsk and Luhansk. But for now, I think Putin is willing to stop here. Yeah, and I'm wondering, uh, the there was an interesting uh, op-ed piece by Thomas Friedman in the New York Times today. Now, I'm usually not a fan of Thomas Friedman, uh, but he did raise. He's one of the few American journalists who has raised in the in the in the commercial media, who has raised what he believes was the grave error of uh, NATO to expand into the former Soviet uh, uh, republics uh, in the 1990s, and he actually quotes in that column. An interview he did back in in uh, 1998 with uh, George Keenan, the the uh, uh, longtime ambassador to the uh, to Russia, and who was uh, one of the architects of the containment policy. And he says from that interview in 1998 that Keenan told him, "I think this is the beginning of a new Cold War." I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely, and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anybody else. Uh, that was George Keenan back in 1998 about NATO's expansion into the East, uh, 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 into Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm wondering to what degree do you think that uh, this Friedman piece is uh, accurate about the roots of what we're seeing right now? Well, thank you. I actually have my own George Cannon, so I don't need Thomas Friedman to know this because I was George Cannon's last research assistant in Princeton. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly when Cannon, when Friedman was writing that piece in '98, uh, so I know this kind of point of view of George Cannon's firsthand because we spoke about it endlessly, many, many times, and what a mistake it is. And uh, he was saying he knows the Russian psyche, and uh, uh, for now they 
willing to kind of surrender to uh, to the United States and Western uh, and Western leadership or Western policies. But one of the things that he said, and he was absolutely right. I mean, his knowledge of Russian psychology was tremendous, and he said, you know, Russians never follow anybody, so it is a mistake to think that when they get stronger, they just go into follow the United States and whatever United States does. Russians don't follow, and Americans need the followers. And so that's going to be a problem head on. Uh, and it will affect Russian policies that would consider it as a violation of their um, of their own messianic, because one of the things that America and Russia share, it's the messianic idea that we are uh, benefiting the world. Russia, of course, with its... Uh, um, um, kind of almost murderous equality of everything and the uh, beautiful Russian soul that you, equates uh, all the measures of man in America with its uh, messianic idea of how everybody should be equally comfortable. Uh, and so Kennan was was very big was was very critical of this and uh, in fact uh, explained that you know Yeltsin first Gorbachev was promised not to move an inch to the to the to the east. Then Yeltsin was promised not to move an inch to the east. Then Yeltsin was told that, well, we would have to probably move an inch, but it's not going to be in your lifetime. That's why when 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 Olaf Scholz meeting with Putin said, well, but Ukraine and Georgia are not going to be admitted in NATO in your lifetime, Putin laughed at him and said, wait a minute, but that was already said before. I have history on my hands because one of the reasons I think Putin is acting non-politically because he is the gatherer of land. So in history, even if militantly, he would need to go in history like Stalin, blood or not, but somebody who doesn't let Russia to be put on its knees, like Khrushchev did, uh, they see it, and especially like Gorbachev did in uh, uh, after the collapse of, um, of the Soviet Union in uh, during well, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in ninety one, so Kennan was very predictive of of that. And in fact, I think Spiegel magazine, the German magazine, just uncovered, just published a few documents where indeed it was discussed that it's not going to move. Uh, NATO is not going to move east. And and you know, Russians are now uh, the official Russians are now citing it uh, left and right, saying that of course we are allowed to. Um, act the way we act because, look, the West is so hypocritical. They cannot teach us um, how to behave. Anina Khrushcheva, <clears throat> 50 years ago yesterday, um, uh, Chinese leader Mao Zedong um, uh, met Richard Nixon. Your latest piece is Putin is no Nixon. Um, as we wrap up, if you could briefly comment on the Putin-China relationship, the Putin-Xi relationship, and how that bears on what's happening right now? Well, I'm not a fan of Nixon, so that was a big thing for me to write. Uh, Russia, Soviet Union and China have been um, sort of the bulwark against the West uh, uh, together. And this relationship with Mao and, well, first with Stalin was very shaky, uh, but then with Khrushchev it completely fell apart. And now we've seen uh, during the Olympics that just uh, just finished, uh, Putin went to Beijing, he was posing with, see, they signed all sorts of, or they've been signing all sorts of cooperative agreements. So it does seem that, once again, we're reliving that that formula of, of Russia and, and China against the uh, menacing and you know, hypocritical West. What I was writing about is that while in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was richer and kind of slightly or, or not slightly kept the upper hand. But now, of course, it is the Chinese who are calling the shots and Putin is there to provide uh, political interference for CCP, and I think uh, Putin will lose in this relationship because China is not going to make up for all the losses that uh, the upcoming sanctions will will bring on to Russia.